So this past weekend, I was down in your neck of the woods. I was in Richmond. I know. And um, I could not see you because of COVID risk. Mm Mm-hmm. But um, I did get a chance to go down to Monument Avenue and look at the uh, statue of Robert E. Lee. I haven't gone down there yet. I've just seen pictures. Oh, it's it's amazing. Um, It has become this piece of protest art. It's it's been tagged up. It's got all kinds of BLM and fuck twelve graffiti, and the city I assume put a jersey wall around it, and now that jersey wall is a mural. That's and amazing. it is its own sort of tourist destination. That's awesome. That maybe they should just leave that because <laughs> it's cause I've seen the pictures, especially at night when it's all lit up and it's like kind of beautiful. I mean, it's gorgeous. I think they should probably let that one stand, and the rest have to come down. Right. And the rest need to be pl- replaced with. Prominent Virginians. And I was just thinking about this. Um, who do you think is the greatest living Virginian? Living? Living. Missy Elliott? No, I don't know. I love her. She's great. No, she's definitely top five. I was thinking it's either Missy or Allen Iverson. Okay. I didn't even know he was Virginian. He went to high school with my wife. Oh, shit. Yeah. Where do you stand on this, Ben? Well, obviously, Allen Iverson is the greatest basketball player of all time. The logo as he's sometimes referred. So I think it should be Allen Iverson, like, memoriam everywhere. The crossover. Mm, the step over. The step over. Yeah, all, all of them. The cupping of the ear. So just just a different poses that he's known for? Absolutely. And look, if people want to have, like, lesser statues and dedicate them to, like, genuine or Pusha T, that's fair, too. Right. Great but, Hill. Great Virginians, absolutely. Mm-hmm. But Allen Iverson, that is that's peak Virginian. Oh, you know who also is a um, Virginian? Jamel Bowie. I don't know if he's actually from Virginia, but he lives in uh, Charlottesville, so maybe he, he could get one because I think he's an amazing writer. Nah. I, I don't really know. What? No, no, I don't. I'm not insulting his writing. I think he's an amazing writer. I just don't think that he's in line to get a sculpture before, say, Magoo. Okay, <laughs> okay, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, like no disrespect, but we're talking about Allen Iverson, so that's right. Everything okay. is in compar- comparison to AI. Okay, so Magoo's on on the level with Allen Iverson. Got it. No, no, <laughs> that's a, what Jason's hi- claiming. That's he, what Jason. There's claiming. a hierarchy here, and Allen <laughs> Iverson is at the top, and everything has to be compared to him. Okay, so Magoo is a is a far lesser Iverson. Yes. Okay, okay, this all makes sense. <laughs> I, who do you want besides AI? I mean, I I don't I don't know. I just a Missy. She's great. I love yeah, Missy. Her. Yeah, Missy. Skate 4P. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Those are all great great choices in my opinion. How do you feel about Malice? I don't know Malice, so I don't know, you know how I feel. Well, I don't. This is a hot take, but I think Malice was better than Pusha up through say We Got It for Cheap Volume Two. Yes, Malice gets a sculpture. Okay, yeah, that's fair. I I don't... He kind of took himself out of the equation, but I I could never really tell the difference between them rapping anyway. Maybe in retrospect I could, but at the time when the clips were rising to prominence... Ah, Malice, yes. I kind of viewed them as interchangeable and also interchangeably good. You know, I saw... Didn't, Jason, didn't we see them together in Central Park? Did we see? I, I think we the clips, right? We went and saw the clips. Oh, and yeah. And, oh, you know what? It was an NERD show, and I think they had the clips open. Yes, think, that might have been They brought out right. Buster for Pastor Cavarcier. Does Old Chad get a statue? Chad Hugo? Yeah, I mean, Chad was definitely as important as um, Robert E. Lee, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Shea? Yeah. Does Shea get a statue? <laughs> That's a statue. Welcome back, guys. Thanks for joining us. As you may have noticed before, there's a third voice on the podcast. We'd like to welcome writer and host of Cookies Hoops podcast, Ben Dietrich. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. So we're going to jump right in. One of the biggest stories right now, and they're all big stories, but 
is Joe Biden's rise in the polls. Mm. Yes. Ironically, none of this has anything to do with Joe Biden, who has been conspicuously absent. But, but is the, he absent because nobody covers him? I don't know. I can't tell. Is it because he just doesn't, is he not showing up and like putting himself out there? Is he, or just not getting press coverage? I can't tell. They're hiding him. Yeah, I think it's a, a brilliant strategy. And I use the word brilliant reluctantly when describing anything the Democratic Party does. Right. But this one, this one is brilliant. You know, they're going with the distance makes the heart grow fonder, really leaning into that. Mm-hmm. He he may be a hologram. No one really knows what <laughs> yeah. Biden is up to. They're just he's in some spider hole in Delaware. Yeah, it, it is. It, it is a great strategy, honestly. They're just letting Trump shoot himself in the foot over and over again. I think that's probably the strategy. Just let Trump do all the work. I mean, that's been Pelosi's, quote, strategy for four years, right? That he, mm-hmm. you know, disqualifies himself, that he impeaches himself whenever you let him run his mouth. But in this case, I think it's also that Biden can't really do too much. You know, Hillary, she could dab. Biden can't dab. You can't yes. put Biden on Ellen to dab. Mm, this is so true. I think Biden could dab on him. Maybe. Today, you can't floss though. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't know if that's true. I think. Does I he know. have that kind of mobility with his I, shoulder? Yeah. Even now, I wonder. Can he? Can he move like that even anymore? I don't know. But he's listen. He's way up in like all the polls, especially the swing states, and um, you know, I still have that thing where I'm like, do we trust the polls? Like. I'm still like, I go back and forth like, uh, Trump's going to win. Trump's not going to win. I can't ever, I'm not, right now I'm in Biden's going to win. That's where my head is. But like, it could change tomorrow. So in 2016, the polls were for the most part correct. Right. Hillary Clinton lost by, you know, 110,000 votes across three states. And the national polling data was correct. This time around, there's more focus on the battleground states, Mm -hmm. and Biden is leading in all the battleground states. In um, a real clear politics poll average, Biden is up 6.4 points in Florida, 7 points in Pennsylvania, 6.5 in Wisconsin, 3 in North Carolina, and 6 in Arizona. So what we're saying is Biden just needs to keep his mouth shut. Just shut up and don't say shit. Lock him in a fucking cryogenic (laughs) chamber. Right. Put him in a cave in his basement, which is where he is, I think. Um, But it it does make sense, though, because if you're Biden, you're kind of a a husk. You're just a vessel. mm -hmm. And what's inside his of that, like his actual politics, are generally irrelevant and kind of obtuse like he's a moderate but you know sort of pretends to be open to certain leftist ideas like they're intentionally cloaking him in it's not mystique but it's in uncertainty that you just know he's better than the alternative and they're not going to make anything specific so we can all just project what we want onto him as long as he doesn't say anything because i feel like every time he does say something that makes news it makes people angry like it makes the left angry because they'll be like look he just said he's not gonna approve medicare for all or you know those kind of things he he when he does speak up then it kind of roots him in a position joe biden just said yesterday that we should protect statues of columbus washington and jefferson oh (laughs) see that's what i'm saying just shut your mouth the fucking room joe Yeah, it's true. Every time he says something, I get irritated and start like hewing back towards I'll never vote for Joe Biden. And once he disappears, I'm like, oh, yeah, man, really got to get this this other guy out. Biden's fine. I know. And then he pops up. He's like, if Medicaid for for all shows up on my desk, I'll veto it. And you're like, God damn it, dude. I know. Do we do we believe that he's really only going to stay for four years like he says? Uh, He may not have a choice. Yeah. I just wonder if, like, I've gotten to this point where, like, you know, he, I hate a lot of his policies, but I've gotten to this point where, like, 
maybe we can push him left. Like, maybe people can push him left. But I'm just like, can we? Can we, though? He's so bought by, like, corporations, just like every other Democrat. I has, think... Has, has, oh, sorry. Uh, go ahead, Jason. Sorry. I think he's going to be a cipher as a president. I don't think he's going to push party policy. I think if we can flip the Senate and get some of these progressives in the House, that it doesn't matter what Biden wants. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because the people who are surrounding him are the same centrists who have been surrounding Clintons and Obama and, and everyone. Like, they, there's no surprises or secrets with the people who are surrounding him. Right. And, but I, I do agree that if the public wants things and is vocal about it and they become popular ideas, then that group of people who are of the consultant class, who are Democratic careerists, don't have a ton of choice but to be pushed. So that's the only reason I, I have a little bit of optimism over sort of seeing the way things have happened. Overall, right. I'm with you. They're not going to willingly go to the left. But because they are people who want to spend their entire lives in politics, there is at least some leeway for them to, in the phrase you just used, to, to read the room. I think we saw a bit of this with the Obama administration. Barack Obama famously said that to him, marriage meant one man, one woman. And over the course of his tenure, that became an untenable stance. Right. I mean, we, he probably privately thought differently, but that was his public opinion. Right, exactly. I mean, that sounds so retrograde now in 2020 that even a centrist dem would say that. But the Overton window moved on that, and I could see that happening with Biden, especially if we flip the Senate, and by we, I mean not the Nazis, mm. if we can flip the Senate and have someone like Liz Warren as Senate Majority Leader, I could see the agenda pushing leftward, regardless of what Biden wants. I mean, we mm. got to get rid of Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi. God. They just, Those, they're, they're dinosaurs. They're, they they're triangulators. Mm -hmm. And I think we can look at them and say that Clinton style of politics, which is finding the bleeding edge between centrists of both parties and trying to like peel away a few Republicans and then while still basically holding the left hostage has not really worked. You know, it lost the presidency, it lost both houses of Congress, it lost the Supreme Court, it lost two thirds of governorships. That doesn't work because it's too amorphous. And I mean, that, that's what they've been running on it, and you still see that that's what they want to do. You've seen that in North Carolina, mm -hmm. or excuse me, Kentucky. Yeah. They want amorphous Democrats to just leech Republican votes. And, like, it's not a selling point. It's not. It doesn't get, you know, liberal voters and left voters excited. I mean, the Republicans don't do this. They don't, they don't, they, they go as far right as they want to go because they don't care about getting Democrat votes. So why should we care about trying to get Republican votes? I just don't understand that strategy. It ultimately doesn't matter. There may be 10% of voters who vacillate between the two parties, but there are vast many more on the far right and far left who don't vote at all because they don't feel that their interests are being represented. That's how you win. Right. I'm, or, I'm, yeah, I was sorry to cut you off. I was saying that I'm a firm believer in enthusiasm being a, a potent weapon for boots on the ground for fundraising, f social media, media attention, just just having people who are into a candidate is a big mm -hmm. deal. What do you guys think about um, the, this story that's kind of been floating about Trump being so like down in the dumps about polls that he's there's whispers of him possibly quitting? Do you guys think that that's a that's a true story? And do you think he would? I think the second he's out of office, he's facing criminal charges. There's no way he gives that up willingly. That's, yeah. I don't, I also don't think his ego would let him quit. I don't, I can't fathom a, 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 a situation where he could tell himself something to make it okay with his ego, you know, like to, to, to make it okay. Though I also go, I know he would be facing criminal charges, but the, I just know how the, the, the Democrats do, and they don't ever follow through. I mean, Obama didn't, didn't do anything uh, about the um, financial collapse. He didn't prosecute any of these assholes. You know, the thing about Trump is that I don't view him as being 
particularly competitive, like in the Michael Jordan wanting it more, the last dance, pathological need to, to win against people. He might be competitive and like he wants to beat someone or humiliate someone. But I do think in theory, he is exactly the kind of person who would quit. He would quit in a heartbeat. If he doesn't think he's going to win, he'll quit. You think? But in this situation, as Jason said, the stakes are too high for him to quit. If he just says, I'm going to step down, yeah, there are criminal charges awaiting you. Does he? So I think the biggest fear is that he will lose in an election and say, I'm not abiding by those results. Mm-hmm. That, that to me has always been like the scariest end game is yeah. Trump's denial of the results of an American election. I mean, he's been sowing the seeds for that for months now. I've been saying this for a couple of years or now, and you know, people paint me as an alarmist, but literally every crazy thing we said that could happen under Trump has happened. And I think there's a very good chance that we may not have a free and fair election. Yeah, I mean, they're going to they're going to suppress the vote. And, you know, they already there was a story a while ago about how they're hiring people to, like, stand outside and monitor if the election is free. and fair. I mean, who are they going to hire? They're going to hire like goons who are going to try to intimidate people. Pinkertons. Goons on payroll. <laughs> yeah. Um, I still don't have a lot of fear of these things, even though they are possibilities and they need to be safeguarded against. Like, I can't, I can't be scared of Donald Trump, despite his power. I can't be scared of him. Like, that's allowing him way too much credit. I, I don't think I'm scared of him. I'm, I think I'm more fearful of his followers, the people who won't accept it and are crazy and he riles them up oh you know what it's storming here sorry guys that's where the adds storm to the is. atmospherics it makes it makes your your point seem even more yeah, no, like, right? like the voice of god All right oh man yeah so i just think his it's i think he i don't think he actually wants to be president he doesn't want to do the actual work but he doesn't want to lose but I do think he will rile up his base and make them do crazy things. I mean, they already have, right? Yeah. I think there's going to be some unrest from the right, regardless of the outcome of this election. I think it'll be put down swiftly, and we may have random you know, outbursts of sectarian violence. But that's to be expected because we're not a developed nation. Mm. We are a third world country, for sure. I mean, well, shit. in a developing nation over here, like mm. the United States. Yeah, right. Well, the other thing I was going to say, though, was that in, in reference to Biden kind of camping out, and is that Biden doesn't generate the kind of ire from the right that Hillary did. And, yeah. You know, when you looked at the, the polls of what people initially loved about Donald Trump, it was that he was running against Hillary Clinton. That's why Lock Her Up drew huge applause at his rallies. Biden doesn't get that. He doesn't even have a good nickname for Biden. Like Creepy Joe, it's Sleepy, Sleepy Joe. Joe. You know, he, 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 Mighty can't, Joe. he can't get people fired up to go against Joe Biden because Joe Biden's just like a, a boomer in a basement. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, like, he's so like milk toast. Yeah, he's he's an old school politician who's been around forever, you know, and it's like, how can you, what are you going to even say about him? All of his negatives are things that Trump does far worse. Like, I know. Like his, he, like his not being able to speak. I mean, Trump, if you just listen to unedited audio or video of him, he's like, makes no sense. He's delusional. I mean, the debates are just going to be Grandpa Simpson, like yelling into the mirror, <laughs> shaking his fist. It's going to be high quality television, though. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm excited. I am excited about that. We should do some special episodes when that happens. One of them having a stroke is on the table. Oh wow! Mm, I feel like it would be Donald Trump. You can just see him getting really red faced <laughs> and stroking out. I could see Trump walking off the debate stage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like mic drop. Yeah, we'll see. 
But the, the polls are, are, are great for Biden because what was Trump's calling card? It was the economy. Mm. And the economy is in absolute shambles to a degree that it never has been ever. Yeah. So you look at him, you're like, look, I put up with all the dumb shit because in my mind, America was steamrolling ahead. And you're like, the economy is garbage. It's all fake. You know, all of a sudden, like, what, what are we even what are we even talking about? The, Although I will the say facade is gone. I will say the um, rich people's feelings graph, i.e. the stock market um, is doing really well. But that doesn't help anyone who is unemployed. You know, that doesn't. And it's, if he loses, I think the Fed is going to stop pumping money into the stock market. And then the real real place where the, the, the stock market is, it will drop to that. For sure. I mean, the people who are economically profiting from his policies are the same ones who are going to give money to his campaign. But that's a, a, that's the literal 1%, right? Mm. Those are not a legion of voters. They are people who can fund a campaign, but they can't necessarily pull the ballot that many. The ballot and you know what? A lot lever. of the people who fund the campaign are not people whose incomes are impacted by the stock market. They're people who own a car dealership. Mm -hmm. And if people can't come in and buy those cars... They don't care if the S&P 500 is through the roof. Right. And, and also, that's what's hurting them. And the other, another thing that's benefiting Biden is this moment we're having, this uprising, has stopped a lot of the left versus liberal infighting. People aren't going after Joe Biden the way that they were, you know, three months ago. Absolutely. I mean, I would say the, the clearest line of, uh, demarcation was universal health care. And that was the sticking point for the left, where it's like, this is a, a moral issue that I can't go on the other side of. But you're right, that's on the back burner now. Yeah, because we have to abolish the police. <laughs> yeah, we do. We, we, we have, I mean, these are all big problems, but we're focused on a different one right now. Another thing that can't be good for Trump right now is this recent scandal involving Russia putting bounties on Alliance troops, i.e. U.S. troops, in Afghanistan. Yeah. The story broke saying that um, we've known for a couple months, we meaning Trump, that Russia has put out financial bounties on the heads of U.S. troops. Then it was revealed that, no, we've known about this for like a year now. And... Trump's defense has been, I was not aware of that. I simply wasn't briefed on this shit. Which is fucking bonkers. Yeah, because it, either way you look at it, if it's he didn't know, that looks terrible. If he did know, that looks terrible. Although, I will say this. I'm a little bit suspicious of the timing of this story. Um, it just feels to me a little bit like and I don't know if this is true, but like maybe Republican intelligence people like dr drop this story because they're starting to see how badly he's doing in the polls and they want to start to distance them themselves from him. And this is like one way they can start to do that. I don't know. Maybe that's me just being crazy conspiracy theorist. I think there's probably a contingency of Republicans who are endangered in the upcoming election who would like to distance themselves from Trump a bit. And maybe this is the kind of issue where they could make a visible line in the sand and say, I'm not like this guy. I'm a Republican and you know I believe in all this garbage mm -hmm. that you like, but I'm not the same as Trump. I'm, I'm a patriot, I'm not the same as him. That said, I don't know about, I mean, I, I, of course I believe this story. I just get so sick of like the Russia stuff. And so, that's yeah. the issue, is that it is Russia. Russia, Russia, Russia. If there was some other country doing this? I mean, here's the thing. Like, I also think there's a part of, like, centrist Democrats who want to, you know, beat the drum to go to war or do something with the military over this. And I, that to me is just, like, not – I don't I don't want to people to get, dr like, drummed up to um, have some sort of n – another military conflict. I mean – we're already doing that. We're already in like two wars still, right? So I Seven. just go, however many it is. It's so many. 
I can't I can't keep track. I think though it's bad that he did nothing if this story is true, which I also go is it true? I don't know. Well, my question is what are we supposed to care about in this one particularly? Because I certainly don't care about Russia putting bounties on US soldiers. Yeah, I don't either. That, I, that doesn't that, like that just sounds like some proxy war shit that we've been doing with Russia since the 1950s. Yeah, it sounds like regular war stuff that they do, you know? It's not it's not some crazy thing that happens. That so, in and of itself isn't that objectionable. It's that while this is happening, Trump is lobbying actively to get Russia back into the G8. Right. I agree. That to That's me is the bad. story. Yes. And the also, story is the story is not Russia doing some like yeah mercenary behavior like whatever I, i'm sure that kind of stuff happens all the time in in between countries who are jockeying over the same real estate via proxy forces right there is a certain a certain segment of the the far left that doesn't believe anything about russia and i go come on how can you not believe anything is going on just because he it, he it is documented that he has like multiple phone calls with Putin, where no one is allowed to listen. Like, that's not fishy to you? That's not weird? Come on. Does he just think Putin is cool? I don't know. I think he wants... He thinks he's a badass. He does. Right? And, and he, he thinks he... I think he wants him to be his best friend, like he said in that tweet. Yeah, like, I think I think he may have financial interests. I don't really believe in, like, the whole compromat stuff. I mean, whatever, maybe. But His tape? Yeah, like maybe there's the piss tape, maybe there's those things. But in general, to me, it seems even lamer. It seems like he views Putin as like a strong man who rules his country with, you know, the 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 Sino iron fist. Like the he is what you want to be as a president and he can't be that. And he wants to be. He wants to ride horses and have parades and assassinate people and do all these cool things that like a dictator can do. But he's like stuck here in the United States. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can't front. A lot of that shit sounds fun. If you're going to be a leader, be Putin. You know, it's like if you're going to run an NBA team, why would you not be James Dolan? Why would you not meddle? Like you, if you own the team, like do the no, cool stuff. No, you would be Mark Cuban. Yeah, yeah, you got to you got to meddle. You, you got to pick. You got to be involved in transactions. You got to, you know, drive coaches out of town. Like do the fun stuff. Yeah, imagine having billions of dollars and buying an NBA team and just sitting there and watching that shit. Couldn't be me. Hell no. Like, imagine being president and not carrying out, you know, assassinations in London with weird nuclear poisons on umbrellas. Okay, so now we know who you guys are. Couldn't be me. <laughs> okay. I mean, I've said that every president should get to personally carry out one drone strike. Yeah, like on your birthday. Sure. I can see that. Sure. Why not? Yeah, they just hand you the PlayStation controller because that's literally what they use to fly Predator it drones. It is. It's crazy. It, it's so fascinating to me that you have the guys running these in like, I don't know, like a suburban plaza parking lot or something. It's like they're in some dark room dri- riding drones around and then get out to like, you know, some sun blasted parking lot and get into their like you know, Toyota Corolla and drive home. Mm. So, so weird. Yeah, blow up the caliphate, have apps at Olive Garden. <laughs> For real, it's so it's such a disconnect from, from war. Yeah, and from actually killing people. It's just like a video game. Um, should we wrap up? We're at 30. Do you want to do it? Do you guys yeah, have an asshole? I, d- I just want Jason to talk about UFOs. Oh, I didn't even know he that was a thing. Oh, yeah, I've seen UFO. Okay. <laughs> no, you know what? Uh, I was... I, this, I found no way to seamlessly add this to the show, but I've sort of come to the conclusion that centrists are right and that PC culture drives people to the right. All right, come on, out with it. Okay, so... There are so many people in this country who don't have a clear ideology. Most people don't have an ideology. Sure. And so I always said, how could a decent person be shifted to the right? But this, they didn't really have left-wing values. But you take these people and you shame them. You say, this thing you believe 
is retrograde. Instead of looking in, they get angry at you. And they decide that you are their enemy. And so they don't actually adopt a right-wing ideology. They decide that they hate liberals because liberals make them feel bad about themselves and will simply support everything that the liberals oppose. And that's why triggering the libs is such a big ethos. Mm. Because they're only right-wingers because liberals made them feel bad. There, I think there's truth to that in the same way of, of like sports fans. Once you pick a side, you don't really care if you're right or wrong. You're just rooting for your guys. Like, I like the Knicks, so I'm going to argue that, you know, Allen Houston is a star until I decide that he's not a star because he's not the right Nick. Eh. So, uh, go ahead. I mean, well, I was just going to say, I saw the other day there was a little protest um, coming down a street in Williamsburg, and they were chanting something along the lines of, like, gentrifier, gentrifier, like, black people used to live here. And the video went fairly viral, and, you know, you saw a bunch of, horrified white people along the street and people like this is this is great i'm like i don't know if this is great because of what jason was saying whether or not that is true or not and people do know that you saw people who could say you know what i'm not in favor of this anymore because now you're attacking me and i'm there is truth to what they're saying but it might not be the best way to keep people on your side so what's the solution how do you get people to look inward and and, you know, maybe evaluate their own behavior and slash beliefs and, and come to a different conclusion other than you're making me feel bad. Imagine thinking you're going to get an answer from this pod. I know, right? We're not experts <laughs> here. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> hey, I default to fuck them. I mean, I mean, like, I don't think that people are unaware of gentrification in New York. I just think being confrontational with people who you might be able to win over to your side could have mixed results. So let me ask you this. What, I didn't see this video. What was the makeup of the protesters? I believe they were mostly black protesters okay. from the, the vantage point of the person taking video. And they're going through Williamsburg, which is a hugely gentrified area. You know, So there was nothing that was untrue about what they were saying. It wasn't, it wasn't confrontational like they were trying to start a fight. I don't know what the solution is, though. People need to feel bad. <laughs> they need to be. They need to feel bad when they have bad thoughts and attitudes and beliefs. Why can't we make them feel bad for that? Well, because we don't know what the people believed. And that's the issue. Gentrification is a very tricky subject. It is because, like, the real villains of gentrification are developers. They're landlords. Mm -hmm. I mean, everyone on this pod right now has gentrified a neighborhood, including me. I was a gentrifier in Fort Greene, Brooklyn, when I moved to Fort Greene. Not because I did not look like the extant population, because it was a very black neighborhood at the time. But I came in as a professional with a professional salary, and I drove those rents up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've gentrified, let's see, Italian neighborhood, Caribbean neighborhood, hipster neighborhood, Polish neighborhood. Okay. Like, that's just... That's just how it. That's who you works. are. Well, I mean, when <laughs> you live kidding. in New York City, well, when I you know. live in New York City and you move into a neighborhood that's not, say, that wasn't gentrified like 150 years ago, mm -hmm. you can pretty much label yourself all of those things. Sure, I mean, and that's one of the problems with New York City is that you get pushed out because and into neighborhoods that are you know have lower rents because that's. That's what New York does. It is not for middle class people anymore. It's for the, the ultra wealthy. And they take over every neighborhood, basically. Right. And then you move into the best neighborhood that you can afford. Mm -hmm. And you end up being a force of gentrification, pushing out the accent population. Yeah. But it literally was the best place you can afford. You're not some rich guy who's like, you know what, fuck it. I'm going to live in Bayside. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what happened to me. I mean, I lived in Park Slope and I got pushed to Sunset Park. And then I got pushed to Bay Ridge. And then I got pushed out of New York because it was too much. Yeah, to me, the, the villains here are, of course, developers, but also people making laws that don't protect people and protect their rents from skyrocketing. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the fact that if you want to get an apartment in Manhattan, let's say a studio that's affordable, 
You have to have 80 times the rent. I know. From like a, a, a someone as a guarantee. That basically says we're only going to rent this to someone who is rich or related to someone who's rich. And like the trickle down from that, of course you end up pushing people out of, out of working class neighborhoods yeah. because it's such a top down force. I mean, that was the problem with all the artists I knew. The vast majority of them didn't have to have a day job. So they got to focus on their art because their parents were paying the rent. That's writers and nice. stand-up comedians and, you know, stuff like that. People like that. Well, that's one thing you've noticed when people have disappeared from New York City during uh, the COVID era. Mm -hmm. Like, wait, where'd you go? What are these photos of? Yeah, they have a backyard. They're in a backyard all of a sudden. <laughs> so we're saying that the real villains here are artists. Yeah. The artists, the the rich the ones. artists are the bad guys. The rich ones. No, the poor artists who move into like to like Empire Avenue in Brooklyn. They're they are the villains. Wow, we're taking some really crazy stances here. Okay. <laughs> I mean, we all know Jay Z is the real villain. <laughs> And I think that's a good place. <laughs> All right. Guys, thank you for listening. Um, please follow us on everything at Eat the Press. And leave us a review on iTunes and rate us. Um, and, Ben, thank you so much for uh, coming on the show. Is there oh, anything wait, you want to plug? Before we let you go, it's, is there anything you'd like to plug? Yeah. Um, well, you know, we're doing the, um, the Cookies Hoops uh, Patreon has been up for a few weeks. And, like, thanks to everyone who's subscribed. And if you want to listen to it without diving in and with a financial commitment, all the episodes pop up late on Spotify or iTunes, so you can check it out. And uh, it's mostly about basketball, usually. Now it's almost nothing about basketball. Nice. So it's kind of the stuff we've just been talking about. That's awesome. But yeah, um, thank you guys so much for having me here. Yeah, and thank you to um, our boy, Kevin McLeod, for doing the music. We love you, Kev. And thank you to Dustin for doing our social media. And we'll see you guys soon.